Placid Horizon fans, in about a week and a half, we are going to begin our Difference and Repetition reading group. It's going to be a live stream. Only patrons will be able to access this on our Patreon account. Mid and high tier patrons will be able to participate in the actual live discussion. Check our show notes to find the link to our Patreon account. Also, find the links to blogs, our merch store, and any other way that you would like to support us. Let's begin. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Our topic today is PC music, accelerationism, and xenofeminism. Today's fundamental question involves asking how we might rupture popular culture from the inside and reach a possible outside. In other words, how do we build a better semiotic parasite to drain away the excess produced by the system in which we exist to prepare ourselves for a radical alternative? On the show today, it's me, Craig, with Adam, and we have two guests, Anton and Will. It's not our Will, it's a new Will, but they're our Will too. So welcome, folks. Hey. Hi. And I'm going to kind of turn the episode over to Adam. This was his brainchild in conjunction with Anton and Will. So take it away, Adam. Okay, good to be taking the position of uh, the grand theoretical inquisitor this episode. I guess just get started off. Um, PC music is, a uh, from what I... My sunset was quite a, a recent scene, somewhat kind of localized in London, but it really took off across the net. So I just wanted to ask, like, for the uninitiated, what is PC music and what is the genre that sort of bloomed out of it? You know, what we call hyperpop, you know, your Hungry Gex, your Sophie's, your Charlie XCX's. And what are sort of cultural concepts that made it feel like kind of like a necessary arrival at its point in, uh, in our cultural moment? When you're asking what is PC music and relating that to hyperpop, you're... There's like three stages to this question in my head. And um, first of all, I'd say that PC music kind of functions as a macro genre of a sort, or at least a collectivity, if you don't want to call it a genre. Um, and things like hyperpop, bubblegum pop, um, escape room, various others, other micro genres that have become associated with it, they kind of all assemble around it um, by various means online, both sonically socially etc but coming back to like the main question like what is pc music it when you're asking such a a blunt ontological question about sound it's really difficult because we categorize it in so many different ways i would probably respond and say there are pc musics like i said earlier they all assemble around this label that was started by ag cook in 2013 he was educated at Goldsmiths in music. That, that's his background. So it does come from London in 2013, now mostly based in the States. The defining feature, which might be very anticlimactic, is not necessarily always in how it sounds, but rather how it positions itself in relationship to this label, the collective, the movement, and A.G. Cook and how he decides to navigate the artists that are affiliated with it. I think the the key thing to to pick up on is 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 PC music's conscious distancing of itself from mainstream pop, and I, in a sense that might be enough, right? Um, it, in the sense that PC music recognizes in a mode of appreciating uh, um, sort of more mainstream pop, and particularly like the the much maligned kind of uh, MTV music of uh, the mid noughties right? Uh, and this, and I, and I feel like what what Anton often emphasizes and what I often emphasize as well is that the attempt to define PC music kind of as a singular genre with identifiable aspects misses the point in the sense that PC music is defined as a genre insofar as it attempts to subvert the identities already present in mainstream music. And it's that defining itself as a subversion that might identify things as PC music in the sense that the the label has picked up that role as a signifier, as a that functional role at least. That's how I see it. That's a, a pretty good description, especially when we relate to terms of genre, because you know, take the term genre, we take the word genre establishes a certain kind of artistic repetition in how we talk about something as belonging to a genre, and then we get into questions of its authenticity within that genre. And I think this touches on something uh, Deleuze is quite good at in the 
entry uh, stages of difference and repetition, where he talks about the difference between uh, a generic form of uh, repetition, where you are compelled to repeat according to a general law that keeps you in a certain category, versus the vehicle of the repetition, which is itself transgressive, which is only repeating itself through a means of creative differentiation. Variation is the means of this. And I guess this makes a lot of sense, especially if we talk about artist collectives like PC Music, where you have, I mean, I, I, I keep thinking of this, this one mural in, in Tate Britain, in the sort of more pop cultural section. There's a great, amazing mural on the wall um, of different genres of electronica, all interlinking with each other within certain influential bands, you know, Throbbing Gristles and your DAFs and your KLFs, etc. And it is, exemplifies exactly, because it is, you know, to drop a buzzword here, a rhizomatic yeah. structure. You originally came to me uh, talking about this, Will, as in terms of a project you and Anton had about doing an ethnography of the kind of practice of PC music in terms of the kind of space it tends to occupy, particularly online. And I think I'll move this question to the forefront because, you know, we cannot go outside or go to any fucking gigs. Yeah. So if there's going to be a, a lost future of gigs to bring back from all this, it's going to be online. And I just wonder, wondering what kind, what sort of space you're trying to interrogate with with both you know your projects that you're both putting forward here. For me, there's it, it's quite a big methodological step because, like you say, we're so used to quote unquote live performance, and indeed the field that I work in, ethnomusicology. Um, which kind of is a, a child of musicology and, ethno- and, and anthropology, so it goes. But, um, you know, it's always focused on going into this, this field, this kind of physical space where music is happening, a sounding body in a room with other bodies reacting to it and so on. So I guess this question of how to, how to engage music and sociality online virtually, how, how do you go about that? ethnographically, which is the primary modus operandi, I guess, of ethnomusicology and anthropology. And, you know, this is a big, mass, a big turn that we're seeing in anthropology. There's digital ant- anthropology is becoming very big, looking at how the virtual is real in the same way that the physical is. So this is something that we're trying to look at. It's doing a lot of things. Um, we're looking at this queer alien critique, which I'm sure Will can say a lot about as well. Um, but we're also thinking about how sounds interact with bodies virtually as a kind of, how does it c- uh, aggregate musical publics, sonic publics in ways um, that might be different or indeed similar to how it happens in person. So this, this methodology of ethnography, I, I guess I'm thinking about it personally in terms of uh, the ontological turn in anthropology, which I suppose we could see as linked to Eduardo Viveros de Castro's cannibal metaphysics. And um, I guess the claim in that is about the decolonization of thought, where anthropologists don't just use the phrase cultural relativism to say, well, they just see things differently, the, this non-Western other. Where, whereas his claim is actually natural relativism, where we actually all see the same thing. We actually all see things in the same way. We just see different things. And um, the claim is being picked up heavily in eco-criticism right now. But what I think is really interesting about this and how it is making its way into ethnomusicology is thinking about, as the ethnomusicologist um, Achua Gautier has termed it, acoustic multinaturalism and how, I guess, hearkening back to Eshun and Sun Ra, how unidentifiable audio objects, although sound isn't necessarily an object, how do these, how do these quasi-objects engage us critically and how do they aggregate people and bodies in virtual spaces? So that's, like, that's the methodological um, impetus for me. And then the theoretical being this queer alien is then engaging how actually is this sound? How can we approach this sound in ways that it can decolonize thought or radicalize thought? And I don't know, I guess, Will, if you want to talk about um, xenofeminism and how this links into that. Perhaps I, perhaps I will try and link it to xenofeminism. I think one thing that I want to 
get right from the start from Viveros to Castro and the the kind of the ethnographic because I, I'm kind of a philosopher by training and so therefore relativism is often the thing that you're told to avoid right like it, you know everyone's constantly saying no Deleuze and Guattari aren't relativists they're not Foucault is not a relativist no no he has these opinions I think that's kind of true but what that sometimes does is it it it, it results in us trying to commit ourselves once again to absolutes. And, 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 and in searching for an absolute, we, we lose sight of the universal, which is a kind of a different thing, which is the, the universal is, is plausibly, um, well, it's more often a predicate as opposed to an object. Um, there is no, we're not looking to um, discover transcendent truths or we're not looking to identify particular goods in the world, but rather we're trying to ascribe to uh, discover rather a, perhaps if I was speaking more science fictionally, locate a universal, which is in itself abstract, which is kind of the link to Badiou that you see in xenofeminism. So what the kind of the insurrection of, of the ontological turn in anthropology allows us to say is that not only do people is, is the, the plurality of existing objects, which must therefore, if we're speaking emancipatorily, be replaced with a commitment towards a single end. And that single end, we posit in this idea of queer alien critique, must be the location of an outside. Uh, and that location of the outside, well, perhaps location isn't even the right word because it involves a construction. And this is one big thing that we really want to talk about, which perhaps even xenofeminism doesn't identify quite so happily, perhaps due to its sort of being so caught up in the initial moments of accelerationism. You know, it was, it was formed at a, uh, a conference run by Reza Negrostani and Pete Wolfendale. And this claim that accelerationism always talks about the outside, the singular outside, and this, the outside never made sense uh, in our heads, uh, because if there are a plurality of insides, there must if we are to remain even vaguely dialectical, be a plurality of outsides, um, the not that depends on what is. And so therefore, if we are to think too singularly about a future, about a future outside, we would kind of lose sight. And this is why we like PC music, because of its being tied up um, with queer spaces, both online and offline. And the way that we might be able to see a line of flight um, towards an outside or, um, or rather bringing the outside in that, fi- that, that is particular to PC music. And it's these particular, u- these particular employments of a universal end to, to reach an outside, to destroy the existence, to you know, melt away the necessity into contingency. This is the kind of the project of queer alien critique. So it's not so much as containing... So in a sense, the breaking through to many outsides is in a kind of a, a taking away of the inherent sub- constructed transcendental limit for counter-construction. Precisely, yeah. So just to sort of give listeners as well, myself, I'm not too sure about what. So what, what would a PC Music Digital Festival entail is, is in terms of a case study of the kind of spaces here? And then I think maybe if we could get, we can get established out, we can sort of move forward into how these interact with people's bodies and particularly in terms of the virtual body and the virtual identity that we put forward through social media and where that can bring forth eruptions and eruptions of, of difference. So I guess I can run through the, the ethnographic kind of notes that I was making. Um, political ecology, you would buy a ticket to the event on Bandcamp. So that was kind of your the gatekeeping that was going on here. There's, there's a payment, there's um, a, an online site that you have to access for this. Um, so there was that, and then you would get uh, the link, as we many of us do today, for a Zoom. And um, you also had to download um, a filter for your camera. And these didn't really make any sense uh, before going into the event. But then once you entered, it was just kind of a lot of video, a lot of people's uh, faces with AG Cook at the top and just kind of purple swirling around the screen. And then eventually, um, it starts and it, it, it's, it's kind of um, a showcase format where there's um, a little introduction, which was, I guess, to go into detail, it was taking a lot from cyberpunk. It was kind of the, the kind of Bandersnatch book kind of format where you see a dagger, you go towards it, and it's kind of taking us through uh, this maze, as it were, the pop crypt, as it was called. 
then you would you would watch an event and then there would be some text which I'm sure Will will have a lot to say about because it was very uh lots of Landian references, lots of um cyberpunk references, very of that um literary style. But then there was this kind of uh, to- towards the end and at certain uh, intersections there would be this it was called the um I think it was called the the Crypt Worm song. And in these moments, everyone's faces would be projected as, you know, spotlighted in turn as like the the thing that everyone was watching. And it would be whichever filter you had chosen and you could choose to be the the crypt worm yourself where where you are the crypt worm and your head rolls along as the crypt worm or you were the healer and that would be shown after the crypt worm. So there was a certain engagement that we don't normally see in things like webinars or at least other times that I've watched someone's performance online. This was, there was a a certain sociality that was enacted where you could see other people and this was happening all while everyone was typing in the chat and discussing the music, commenting on the music and the classic things that you would expect to see on like YouTube comments, but it was happening live in real time and everyone was able to react to each other. So this was the overall process. The kinds of ethnographic notes I was making were just things that people were saying, how things sounded. And I guess as you were kind of hinting to in the latter part, like what was the actual experience of sounds in this event? But I was listening to it with headphones. It started at 9pm, went on till about one in the morning. And I did personally experience some kind of listening fatigue when you're listening with you know not necessarily the quality of listening equipment that was intended for the performance or or the recording and a lot of things were clipping for me in the audio but also just there were certain performances umaru and caro and death sim like just listening I don't have really the words to describe it other than alien sounds. And, you know, as someone who studies music, I've listened to a lot of music and I listen to a lot of pop music. And, you know, we get told what is radical, what isn't radical. We get told what is new and we learn about the avant-garde. And I just found that the, the, the kind of amalgam of various different performers that were being showcased kind of showed to me sonically or made me hear just how it's this label, this collective is straddling the line between the popular and the avant-garde. Part of my ethnographic work, kind of hearkening back to Viveros de Castro, one of the biggest claims about his perspectivism and the ontological turn is to take our interlocutors seriously. You know, don't see the ethnographer as the person who has to provide the grand theory for the event, the person who has to make sense of it all structurally. We have to like listen to what people are saying about these things. And one of the comments that really stood out to me, and you know, I can't tell if it was just a meme or whether there was some kind of sincerity in it. Not that memes don't have sincerity, but someone said, this is what it sounds like on the inside of a USB. And... <laughs> <laughs> There were so many things that that conjured for me. It made me think of this long genealogical history of kind of the fetishization of technology and um, places like IRCAM, the research institute in Paris, where they kind of fetishize computer music and coding. And this kind of just, you know, this this person who was just an audience member at this event saying it's what it sounds like inside a USB. And obviously, I think there was a lot of humor in that, but also... There's a sense that people are kind of having to come up with different language to discuss what it is they're hearing. And incidentally, or perhaps not incidentally, they're referring to technological objects to kind of objectify and objectivate the sounds that they're hearing. So to think about and to experience these sounds, that kind of image of the inside of the USB was something that really struck me. And I guess if you're going to hinge us towards Sophie now, it's sort of linking in with this whole idea of, um, you know, Will mentioned emancipation, like how do these sounds 
change our ontological assumptions about sound and music? And how do those ontological, I guess, disturbances disturb our epistemological presumptions? The description of that event is just, that is just absolutely unseen and fraudulent because as much as I, I mean, I, I, I miss gigs, but at the end of the day, I'm an electronic musician at the end of the day. And that sort of experience is just, you know, it's, it sounds feels like an outside, but even an outside more radical than simply going outside. I mean, it's the, the idea of being, this is what being inside a USB feels like, feels particularly relevant because you know, a USB is a, it's, it's a system of control and access that carries information and it can carry multiplicity information. Its only limit is really it's its own, its own capacity. And it's the idea of sort of feeling as if you have been transplanted into this entirely multiplicitous yet entirely controlled system of cybernetic access. And the idea as well of putting yourself in these filters voluntarily and having your sort of participating in a wholly communal public event, but it is entirely digitalized and virtual. You're partaking in a, a self subjection to a sort of system of control, but this time, unlike in capitalism, it's actually there. You actually sort of know it's there, fully controlling, fully cybernetic, and what creates you as a subject and what even lets, makes that your own subject, especially your face. You know, I felt it's all about the face, really. It makes it an object of play, makes it an object of plasticity and, and malleability. And I think this would definitely tie into some of the Sophie stuff because, you know, you're, you're sort of, you know, shopping around for one of these events kind of sounds a bit like, you know, you're, you're face shopping, you're synthesizing the real of what face you're presenting. And there's some sort of authentic, authentic kind of enjoyment to that, which I think pivots really well into sort of the, the, the wider discussion, particularly around Sophie's music. And as, as Will put in, in Will's amazing piece, the, the, the explosion of, of identity that comes around in that sort of musical aesthetic, aesthetic experience. I wasn't going to say anything meaningful. I was just going to thank you because that, that um, kind of taking that USB idea further is just perfect. Yeah, love that. I'm, I have to say, I'm a little bit, I feel like I wanted to be the one to hop on the USB comment and give you my on the fly ontology of USBs, <laughs> which was, you know, it was interesting. As soon as you said the word, uh, it made me think of what kind of object a USB, like a flash drive is, right? It's, you know, at once it's uh, a medium of communication. It's swappable. I can give it to you. You can give it to me, but it's also secret, something easily lost. Right. And so to be lost inside it is this sort of merger of of secrecy and communication that I think is, you know, it just sets you dreaming once you think about it, as does a lot of the music that I listen to preparing for this episode. And so, yeah, let's talk about the Sophie stuff a little bit. I have just this huge bundle question that has so much in it. And maybe we can just pick up any one strand that we think is interesting. Now, I was aware of Sophie prior to doing this episode but I hadn't gone into her work the way that I did in the past week or so. But I was wondering where you think, or, or how do you think, does PC music find its place among trends like Vaporwave, for example, which I believe has an implicit critique of consumer culture and capitalism more broadly within it. And I'm thinking, of course, about Sophie's face shopping video in particular, which was easily my favorite amongst the bunch. And one of the first things that I thought of when seeing that was the idea of faciality from Deleuze and Gattari, in which the figure of the face is deployed as a mechanism of social control. And so, in the video for face shopping, the face acts as a critique of the face, presenting the face undergoing these continual auto-deformations and torturous splicings that you see. It, it's kind of reminiscent of things that I was familiar with when first encountering Aphex Twin. Uh, another question that I had coming into this was about the artist Arca, who many people who who follow PC music don't think is a PC music artist. But based on what you folks are saying today, I have some different ideas about that. Regardless, those three artists, Sophie, Arca, Aphex Twin, what, when I see them, there's one thing that they're doing that a lot of other electronic artists aren't, which is this kind of showcasing of the face or the body, a kind of bracketing it out. And there's almost a sort of like Antonin Artaud theater of cruelty thing happening where we get to observe the body in these odd vivisections and deformed angularities. And all of that is meant to create this sort of effective shift in us. 
I'm curious if there's if if any of what I said there sort of ties into the the analysis that you folks are working on. I, I can comment on vaporwave at the end because that's a very big topic as well. But um, I guess Arka and Sophie, you saying they're showcasing the body. And in many ways, for me, specifically in Arca's non-binary and Sophie's infatuation and face shopping and it's okay to cry and just everything by Sophie, like I think there's a sense in which the music, like a lot of electronic music is very visceral, of course, which isn't, you know, it's not a new thing, but there's always a sense of the sonified body and the sounded body in their work. And to me, mm. I think this, in terms of my analysis coming from a queer theory background, um, this has a lot to do with recent trans movements in scholarship. So I don't know if people are aware of um, literature in transgender studies quarterly, but there's a lot of articles that kind of denounce, not denouncing, but critiquing queer theory as like an institutionalized practice because queer theory has been written about as something that kind of seeks to transcend the body and it, it, it doesn't speak about binary genders and of it kind of rejects all binaries whereas a lot of trans scholarship is saying that well at least in trans music methods that um are coming out now the trans scholars like Dana Bates are writing about trans as an investment in the body and it, which <coughs> is, may or may not be antithetical to what queer theory is trying to do but this idea of investing in the body is something that we as trans people do, we, we're navigating how we relate our bodies to how we think of ourselves and how others think about us. And so, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that because you saying that they're showcasing the body and showcasing the face, to me, it has a lot to do with how much those things do mean to them, non-binary and, and trans performers. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know if that is as critical an analysis as you wanted but it was just an interesting link that i thought with something that's going on in academic discourse well i think there's an incredible power in being able to i use the word bracket i don't know if that's the right word i've been reading too much husserl over the past day or two but um i think at least it it's isolating the face and the body in a certain way which demonstrates its singular plasticity and that's what I thought was interesting. You get this a bit in, in Aphex Twin in, in some of the videos from the past. I'm thinking primarily of Come to Daddy right now. I'm thinking about Arca too. The one video where there's the woman dancing with the luminescent body and there's the lasers all over her body and it's kind of tumorizing her as the song goes on, you know, and it's this sort of blend of gorgeousness and grotesque that's just very captivating and in that moment you you come to see the body as something you know we might say aberrant in some way but the whole process of just embodiment seems to be something that becomes aberrant in its demonstration of its own plasticity yeah just to um talk about this um this question of aberrance or this 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 question of um the grotesque i think in the chapter on faciality in A Thousand Plateaus, Deleuze and Guattari, the, the description of faciality is, the, 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 you know, they say that the face has always been kind of inhuman, right? Uh, and, and I think the reason they say that, I think, it's not always easy to sift it, but the reason they say that, I think, is because what they want to describe is that the face, the face is always constructed. The face is quite literally that which face is, right? And what, and the fact that it is constructed, we should notice that it has always been grotesque. The face, the construction of identity has always been this machinic process of remanufacturing oneself in order to make sense, to make oneself intelligible in the world, right? That's great. Like we know about, um, you, know, you know, even the most sort of um, benign forms of plastic surgery, ultimately, if you saw them processed, would be quite grotesque quite often. And, it, and, and I think what's, I mean, and just to, mention the, uh, or directly quote Deleuze and Guattari, they say that its re-territorialization must not be confused with a return to a primitive or older territoriality. It necessarily implies a, a set of artifices by which one element, blah, blah, blah. But the fact that um, there is nothing other than artifice, this is Deleuze and Guattari's point, and because there is no authentic self to be hidden or to be presented, right, to be represented, there is nothing except the presentation. And this is what I think is so obvious in Sophie, is that 
the point is, is that trans people are forced by virtue of the necessity of social integration to go through, you know, for example, you know, uh, facial feminization surgery, which is incredibly grotesque and is obviously the, the reference point for face shopping by Sophie. And the point is, is that the, the, the grotesque formation of the body is brought to the forefront as the, the, what is regarded as a key point in the identity of trans people and queer people more gen, and often, you know, queer people more generally. And it's this, um, necessary highlighting of the grotesqueness of the continual construction of the of the socially intelligible body which gives um transness its uh, its uh its necessary radicality right but this is brought into pc music via this kind of apparently often chaotic confused mishmash of techno of electronic music avant-garde music and then like Britney Spears right um or um uh, and the fact is is that th there is no reason that these things can't go together and the the, the point is, is is to construct a complete artifice and Sophie in an interview describes that she never used acoustic instrument she says well why would I um because there's nothing that I'm attempting to represent so what if I made a sound if I try to imagine what a piano the size of a mountain would sound like and the reason for this is, is that in her music, um, and I think broadly the more radical portions of PC music often do, is bring to light the artificiality of identity. And this is what brings it so close to queer politics, right? It's because artificial, because queerness has always been seen as inauthentic. You're not really gay or you're not really trans. These aren't real feelings, right? This, and the, the artificiality that the fact that we all know it's artificial and queer people know that your desire is artificial too. And that's the, the radicality of it. And perhaps what, what brings in this idea of faciality and Deleuze and Guattari, you know, makes it so relevant to Sophie's music and PC music more generally. Thanks, Will, for bringing up the sounds again, because looking at the videos is, it carries a lot of the information. And of course, lyrics carry a lot of information, but I often... I don't like to reify sound as like an object in and of itself, but I do like to think about, you know, what are the ways in which sound as this kind of quasi object that um, effectively intermingles with bodies, both in human and non-human, in, in what way does it engage with what Will was talking about, like the grotesque, the grotesque in this kind of negotiation of asserting the validity of the trans and queer experience. And I, I just think there's something really interesting to talk about in terms of like the actual form and vocality that Sophie like employs within the track itself. So aside from the actual lyrics, because of course my face is front of shop, etc., it's quite it's quite simple. And then the kind of B section where there's this hyper the pitch shift all the way up, EQ distortion, you can't really hear properly what is being said in the, it, it's, sorry, I was going to talk about this A and this B section and how there's kind of like multiple kinds of femininity being explored. And it's kind of commenting in a way on this trope that we see in a lot of noughties, early 2010s kind of collab music where you see the male rapper um, singing the rap part and then there's like a female voice that comes in and sings the highly melismatic vocal part. Evanescence. And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this kind of, <laughs> this kind of um, something that we all, a lot of us grew up with and we love. There's always this kind of, the masculine person delivers the logos. They deliver the semantics, the meaning. And then the female vocality, the, the vocality that is associated more with eros and the body than the mind and the logos, that, that kind of comes in in this B section and provides us with some kind of jouissance, but to, not to bring in much baggage anyway. But I think Sophie kind of employing both of these vocalities in, these, in, this, in this B section, it, it, it explores multiple femininities to me because it's, you know, it's it's she is saying the words in the part that we'd normally associate with the, with the male, the masculine. It's presenting the quasi rap um, vocality, and then there's also the, as I said, the hyper stylized, over synthesized voice in the B section. So I don't know that I just wanted to bring it back to the sounds in some ways to think about 
beyond the things that we normally talk about as concrete semantic meaning, how can sound be the parasitic semiotic? How can sound be the thing that kind of pushes you um, to rethink both what you think sound is and therefore how you think about how it relates to you and the world? Yeah, it seems that the celerity and the dexterity of the music, of the production and the writing, is what gets us beyond, and I want to bring back what Adam was talking about earlier uh, when he invoked difference and repetition. You know, we have this general law of difference in the form of resemblance, right? But when we turn up the speed on music and we do these sort of schizophrenic shifts, as, as you hear in some of Sophie's tracks, to what seems like a plethora of pop tunes all converging into one. It's almost as if you get out of the frame of understanding anything to resemble anything else at all. And the, the form of difference that, that inhabits the, the music in the form of intensities is one that is not easily subordinated to resemblance in any way, shape, or form. And it seems that there's a number of devices to do this, and one of those is accelerating the music, and then the sort of like the dexterous schizophrenic thing, you know, where there's a kind of frenetic movement between different either genres within a single song or different kinds of pop song, injecting a little bit of Britney here, and then going to this kind of trap beat thing over here for a second. But, and, and I contrast that like with Vaporwave, if we want to get to this part of this discussion too, which is this kind of slowing down de deceleration of music and reveals a, a, a very different quality to what I think stacks up to be the same genre of music, which is pop, but they're doing very different things. It's quite difficult because I wouldn't, pop as genre is it's just so broad uh, in terms mm. of vaporwave and pc music so like you say yes vaporwave is the slowing down the kind of hypnotic the nostalgic um very that aesthetic also intense similarly i think a link between them not just this um umbrella term pop is also a kind of an intensification of internet aesthetics. So uh, I guess vaporwave being as a micro genre being, you know, very Tumblr, mm. very um, being shared with people memeing about early Microsoft or early 3D design and things like this to, and then attaching it to sound that is almost a me, almost a sonic meme because it's I mean, perhaps I can't remember which track I'm thinking of, but there's like a very, a very basic '70s song that is just played like on loop, eight bars for like the whole thing. Very, very hypnotic with like a rainbow road as the video. Uh, so, like, I, I see what you mean. Like, this kind of speed and intensity um, is uh, uh, something that could distinguish between the two. And for me, at least, like as you suggest, anyway, it is something that distinguishes between vaporwave and PC music. I, I do see in PC music and intensity and speed, but even in tracks that don't have a, like BPM as the speed that we might conventionally think of in music, even tracks like Sophie's infatuation, like there isn't, it's, it's a, quite a slow BPM. It's not one of the fastest BPMs. It's also got a very slow harmonic rhythm. So it doesn't really change. Like the bass line moves every three or four beats or something. So, even in those slower tracks, to me, there are kind of micro speeds that happen within the track. So I don't know if you notice it in Sophie, but in Infatuation, there's that kind of lemonade sound that she puts in. Um, the kind of the fizzing and the bubbling. It's almost like um, ASMR of someone chewing something or popping candy. There's those, even in like these slow tracks, there's, there are like micro speeds and micro intensities that are happening that as you suggest, aren't really, I don't really hear them in much vaporwave or even chill wave, like these other internet micro genres. So yeah, they're, they're both pop, but I think there's, there's something happening in PC music, both aesthetically and institutionally, as in like how it's related to AG Cook, etc. Um, but yeah, I think it's a very valid analysis to say that th there's an intensity to PC music that is part of its um, both distinguishment as a genre in and of itself, but also as a genre that relates to other genres. I wonder if I could bring sort of another question to the forefront by just trying to link up these these uh, 
disparate genres of, uh, of PC music and vaporwave. Because in terms of uh, their affect, it seems to me at least, and especially in relation to the temporality of this, this affect as it directs to a certain period in time, they're, they're completely op opposed because the vaporwave aesthetic is, this is why, this is why fash wave is still so popular, and then so labor wave, which is also as, as directed towards the past as fash wave because the Soviet Union isn't coming back and uh, we should stop trying. Um, but, you know, it's both, you know, you can go back, remember this, remember how good it was. It is the idea of a, a lost future, and it's, it's hauntological. And the thing is with PC music is it's the, the affect, I mean, just to take uh, Sophie's record as, as an example, there's an entire sort of build-up to a future temporality in, embedded in the whole thing. I mean, in terms of the, the affect of the, of, of the whole record, it starts off very you know, mellow, open, it's okay to cry. It's, like, it's a very welcoming kind of sound, and it runs you through the gauntlet of this total eruption of, of what we would consider to be you know, typical sort of pop, bubblegum pop tonalities. These weird sort of industrial eruptions, even completely uh, disorienting in a way, sort of slow, almost even no you know, noisy kind of kind of tracks. And at the end of it, you have this incredible sort of affirmational thing of having your sort of sonic persona as music listener dissolved in the sort of song like Immaterial, where you sort of are given this sense of plasticity, and then at the end, slight break in the tone, then you manage to get hit in the face with. There's a whole new world out there, and this is direction towards novelty, which makes it feel to me a bit like listening to it feels a little bit like a kind of a a phenomenology of spirit kind of a process through this kind of ups and downs of consciousness, and it feels like a construction that's meant to raise consciousness. And I guess I guess the question overall is, in terms of affect and how we relate to our own temporality as the future of ourselves, the future of our bodies, and how we identify and how we understand the artifice of identity. Could we say that you know, this, this, rec this record, Oil of Every uh, Person's Un Insides, you know, is it a kind of a paradigm case for what under your collective analysis would be a kind of queer alien consciousness-raising activity? I think the, the key thing for me with Sophie is that uh, on this sort of point about hauntology and, and, and hence consciousness raising, um, I, I, I sort of realized that the reason why this music isn't very hauntological and why you don't see that much hauntological uh, music that comes out of the queer scene is because hauntology is about, about lost futures, right? Well, it's not often that queer people have had actually a future to lose, right? The future has always had to be invented for, uh, for queer people. There is no nostalgic thing to look past to because as bad as things often are, right, the only thing that, we, that, that queer people can look to is to the future, right? And that this is the thing about, um, about why I think that there is just so many parallels between um, PC music, and particularly Sophie, and accelerationism. It's because I think that it really, that Sophie's music is in many ways so easily understandable, at least through the lens of the weird and the eerie, uh, precisely because, as I argue in the article, the, the the sounds that actually sound the most weird in Sophie's are, are well, or at least they always sound the weirdest to me, are those moments of complete bubblegum pop aesthetics, sort of this unashamed appreciation of, you know, what might appear to be the most banal melodic lines. Um, and the reason for that, and the reason that that is so weird, is because the lines between what is a transgression and what is acceptable are precisely what defines the transgressions in the first place. And so rather than trying to, you know, just make, you know, music um, entirely operating in this sort of zone of social exclusion, it brings the inside into that zone of social exclusion and hence moves towards an outside and shows. And this is, um, this is something about in Xena feminism when they bring up this idea of a semiotic parasite. It's exactly that. It's eating the 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 the, um, the the kind of the body, the machinic production of uh, the machinic center center of libidinal engineering that is the kind of the corporate MTV end of pop, and and spitting it out in this form of kind of completely um, you know uh, uh, affirmationist um, weird presence, right? Uh, but simultaneously, Sophie's music is not just weird in the sense it's also eerie. 
Um, because if eerie and eeriness we define in Fisher's sense as the, the absence of a presence, one has to reconcile the fact that one, most people who listen to Sophie's music, you know, let's say have never been to a queer club. They've never been to, you know, they've never been to Berlin and they've never played in these places where Sophie's uh, has played and that have better for better or worse become cultural centers of queer culture. Right. And the reason why therefore this is eerie is because it shows that there's someone else out there. There is, there is a zone outside of the way that you currently have your configurations. There are, there are entire communities, collectivities, and styles and genres and desires to completely transgress your own. And in so doing, she, as I say, it, you know, it melts into contingency, the arbitrary barriers between, um, you know, what is inside and what is outside, and hence brings the outside in. Now, this is not to say that the outside already exists in the form of queerness, but rather that it can serve as a zone of consciousness raising precisely in order to reorient oneself um, epistemologically and in, the, in terms of affect towards that outside, because the experience of listening to Sophie quite often um, is not something, because it's not something that people have encountered before, it sort of attempts, I think, to, to, to reconfigure one's feelings so that one changes what it is like to listen to music or um, changes what what it is like in the sense in this phenomenological sense of how it is to participate in in music um, and I, and I think that that's the kind of the, the plausibly xenofeminist end of of and and xenofeminist and hence accelerationist end of PC music precisely because it's this game of playing the you know playing the strings of the machinic unconscious in order to subvert its own ends right to to make the contradictions which stutter the existing machine and I I think that's the sense in which it's accelerationist um it's you know it's not accelerationist one thing I know I've gone on for a while but one thing that I want to mention is that accelerationism kind of gets this justifiably bad rap because it talks about kind of like myths and legends and this kind of you know proto Norse aesthetic of the Landian writings, right? And I think that that's really problematic because it assumes that the myths of the kind of white inside are the myths of everyone else. You know, the mythos of Lovecraft. Why, that's not my myth. Those aren't the myths that have built have have have, have built the fictions of of my life. Um, and it's certainly not the myths that built the fiction of Sophie's life. And Sophie's music, therefore, is a knowing construction of a fiction which makes itself real precisely a hyperstition um, and br therefore brings the outside in through the creation of a non-entity that is Sophie that can absorb uh, into itself all the kind of the signifying, um, you know, despotic um, corporate pop and spit it out uh, towards an outside. And this is the, 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 the kind of truly accelerationist point, you know, there is this plurality of insides and therefore a plurality of subjectivations that we can use to kind of raise consciousness. No, that was absolutely uh, fucking beautiful. Uh, <laughs> uh, bloody hell. Yeah, I wanted to pick up the thread where you talked about queer folks having no lost futures. And I want to bring that into dialogue with the idea of anti-hauntology, which is a term that I've seen online recently uh, from Matt C., you know, who did the books on Mark Fisher and so forth. And just in the context of this conversation, it made me think of, of Nietzsche and the inversion of the retrospective impulse that's associated with nostalgia. And I'm, I'm curious if there's just an inherent danger, uh, I mean, all across the board, politically speaking, when it comes to nostalgia in, in any form. Basically, the question that I want to ask is, is the redemptive power, the ability to recover a lost future, does it carry with it the, the sort of kernel of a microfascism or just a very real fascism in all cases? And maybe is what PC music and what the way that Sophie is showing us, is this more like the revolutionary road? I wouldn't like to say that hauntology carries with it a microfascism, though it could, right? Like it, it, it surely could. In a sense, you could understand fascism as a call for a lost future, but a lost pure future. And this is the, I mean, this is the sense in which I think acid communism has sometimes been misunderstood in Fisher's work as a fundamentally hauntological thought. You know, there was this uh, 
nascent social movement that was emerging emerging in kind of the late 60s and particularly the early 70s that supposedly never got off and was kind of ultimately smashed by Thatcherism and Reaganism and neoliberalism the world over. And that that and so we've just got to kind of get back there. <sighs> I don't think that's ever what it was really about. And mm. that would be, that would be, no, 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 and, no I, 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 I'm sure. But, and, and I think that that's what it is, is certainly a myth, right? You know, it's, it, it, there's not that much empirical evidence for this mm. crossover between communism, leftism and psychedelia. They're, they're just, there's a little bit and there were little flash ups here and there. And there was, were these kind of interesting crossovers, but it's not like there are any political parties. Uh, from what I could tell, or it's not like there are any kind of serious social movements, any serious social organization. And either one could think that, well, we just don't care about social organization, or perhaps more plausibly, the point is, is that we're inventing this kind of social myth. Now, my problem with the signifier of acid communism, and I don't think this is anything that is really there in Fisher's work, but the idea that there should be a singular myth that might bring out the, uh, you know, make everyone sort of wake up, open their eyes, realize that, you know, it's, you know, it's communism time baby um this is just never going to happen right and th and th the mm. fictions always have to be consistently plural um plural but open yeah i'm not sure if it ever pointed to a singular future i i think it was more the case that there was an inchoate promise yeah that just escaped us at every moment along the way and wow to to really do an a sort of ethics or an ontology of hauntology what is it it in one sense it's it's ironic yeah. right we're looking back at the past in a, in a in an ironic sort of way and through that ironic portal perhaps we can see at least the glimmer of that forgotten inchoate promise and maybe touch its energy just enough to invigorate the future which would in a sense be revolutionary i think uh, i think maybe you can sort of read this especially in light of the post-capitalist desire lectures that have come out and it, especially in terms of the the music you know, the musical effective legacy of mark fisher i mean just a couple uh, recently i went to the 4k punk nights yeah on a, you know it was an ica dj set there was a discord smoking area it was it was beautiful but what it seems it seems like all this stuff is, is a critique against one kind of genre that everyone tends to associate Mark Fisher with, and for, for mostly good reasons. But I think it's something that a figure that he ultimately breaks with in, in his later work, which I don't think we've really come to grips with, which is this kind of seems to be like an overall critique of the attempts to, to have an alternative social vision as elaborated in culture that actually provided, no, never really actually got to provide an alternative that wasn't was only ever sort of negatively defined because when i think of sophie's like a critique of the goth they're my people i love them gospel i love it I, well you've got a lot of fucking problems but you know generally <laughs> and it's this idea of it was always trying to create an outside from the offset and not really understand multiplicity of the inside the inside was always the man yeah. you know the, the man the church this monolithic uh stance and people sort of reach back into myths of satanism or particularly lovecraft lovecraft satanism old norse myths this yeah. is why you have metals one of the few genres with an entire subgenre openly devoted to national socialism and it it, show, it sort of sees this like as a, as a way of producing a political cultural artifact i think this is actually a standing testament to the idea that you need to take the outside in and radicalize it, not on its own terms, but by sharing it. It was never actually always on its own terms. It already has this malleability in it. There's no plas There's no syntheticness to the real before the goth, because the goth is always defining itself against a negatively defined substantial thing that it's fortifying itself against. Whereas if you realize that this process is something you can't escape, subjectiviation, faciality is always operating within you then you can try and take hold of it because you know what forces are in you. you know, a, goth, a goth doesn't know what it's like to be inside a USB because they're all stuck in their fucking conference. <laughs> you know, it's, I think this is like a very great critique of the kind of idea that puts a contradiction on the outside as something that you're trying to resist coming into. You don't want to be. This is, of course, in, in other uh, groups, but particularly in you know, metal and punk, the idea of the poser, the inauthentic, the person who isn't facializing in the right way, away from the negatively defined other, the man. You know, the man, the forces of power. And I think this is a great musical methodology for trying to accelerate and break through what you're trying to critique or what even trying to provide an alternative to. I mean, it's 
this is, I mean, honestly, this, thing, this has definitely helped me sort of think about how I even do my own music because I started off as a metal slash noise guy and now I'm sort of doing beats and all that because I realised that this, you can't really produce an affect of an alternative purely through negativity. It's always going to relapse into this flight from something which you're trying to fortify against. It always comes across as substantial, more real than it actually is, and by then you've already lost the game. So this is a, this is a post goth Mark Fisher. We need to abandon the, the goth myth <laughs> of Mark Fisher. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned negation and you think about Sophie as a negation of goth. It just made me think more in terms of, well, how at the start of Matt C's introduction to that, he writes about the surprise of Fisher's like valorization of the hippies. And um it just made me think about kind of just the general history of popular music and how there are these various fissures, not Mark fissures, the fissures that happen where people think that there's something radical on the horizon. I don't know, I'm thinking about disco, house, techno, grime um, as, as part of that genealogy that leads up to PC music, I guess, because I guess PC music is the next radical thing after grime. It, it kind of it picks up where dance music kind of died out. And I think, yeah, I kind of, like when you say that there is no, the negation doesn't really get you anywhere because I don't see it, because I, I think the discourse on these older genres was about, oh, they, they negate, they're counter-hegemonic, they, they, provide, they provide a countercultural consciousness raising. But then we saw that that was, that was failed. It didn't actually do that. Disco turned into well, the politics of pleasure and they just, they, they, they found new narratives. I guess the, the capitalist machine re-territorialized them. It found new ways to make sense of these things. And in a way, not to be cast a negative light, um, not, not on Sophie, but on her, on her sound objects, we see this happening with Sophie's tracks today. Like the, uh, for example, like Lemonade and, uh, VZ are already being included on advertisements and they're being, you know, they're being re-territorialized into the mainstream. And that, that seems like a very, a very basic analysis to be, oh, it's been used in advertising, therefore it's no longer counter-hegemonic. But it's more so pointing out the, the polysemy of musical meaning in a way. Like uh, these tracks come to mean something for us as people who understand and know Sophie's life and her wider discogue and her in relation to PC music. But for someone who doesn't know this, this can, when it's decontextualized or there is a kind of context collapse when the sound appears on an advertisement, th there's, there's no negation, but there's, al there's also no radical assemblage. There's no possibility for um, emancipation or consciousness raising. So I think we need to remain cognizant of the fact that it will become just as easy for PC music to be re-territorialized and swallowed back up to the inside rather than folding it back in on itself. Um, I don't know, that that's not so much, you know, that's not a very positive or reparative take, but it's just something that I've noticed and the, the comment about negation just made me think about that. I want to extend a very warm thanks to Anton and Will for providing us with the opportunity to immerse ourselves in a discourse here that was very unfamiliar to me and was a great learning experience. Our next show is going to be a Q&A episode for our patrons. If you are a patron who subscribes for as little as $1, you can participate and submit to us questions. So hop in and maybe there's a philosophical question on your mind that we can address directly on the show. Also, a new Acid Horizon spin-off podcast called Inner Experience is coming soon, too. Stick around our social media to hear more about that in the very near future. In addition to an upcoming episode on Friedrich Engels, we also have our Difference in Repetition reading group that's starting up very soon, I think in like a week and a half or something. So hop onto our Patreon account and get all the latest information on that. That's coming very soon. In the meantime, know that there is not one, but many outsides on the other side of the acid horizon. Take care.
Thank mm-hmm. you.